Hi all, thanks for joining. Our first session for today is optimizing application performance on Kubernetes by Dinakar Guniguntala. Thanks Dinakar and um, a brief introduction about Dinakar. Dinakar is an architect of the Cruise project. Dinakar is focused on uh, autonomous performance tuning and exploring the usage of machine learning and hyperparameter optimization in the performance domain specific to Kubernetes and cloud. So Dinakar previously worked on making the open J9 Java virtual machine run more efficiently in the cloud and was the official maintainer of the adopt open JDK Docker images. Dinakar loves open source astronomy and volleyball and is a prolific, prolific speaker at conferences. So a brief introduction about the topic that we're going to talk today. So now that you have applications running on Kubernetes, wondering how to get the response time that you need, tuning applications to get the performance that you need in Kubernetes and can be challenging. At the same time, there are a number of Kubernetes features that we used in the right way can go a long way to get the most of underlying hardware resources. This talk looks into each and every aspect of optimizing a Kubernetes cluster, starting from the most basic node affinities to advanced methods, such as tuning microservices, each with examples and a demo. We'll also be specifically looking at tools that help to not only right size your containers, but also optimize the runtimes. So we'll start the session. Uh, and thank you for attending this session. Uh, this is Dinakar Guniguntala. I work at Red Hat, where my primary job is to see how runtime such as Java can be made to run better in Kubernetes. And that is what I'll be talking about today. Um, has it ever happened to you when you talk technology to customers only for them to ask what's the mileage? So today we will look at ways to improve the mileage that you can get with your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so let me take a moment to define what I mean by performance. Uh, traditionally, performance looks at three key aspects, throughput, response time, and utilization of system resources. Uh, these are the criteria that we'll be looking to optimize in today's presentation as well. However, I'll be confining myself only to compute. So before we dive into the presentation, I thought it'd be good to define the overall context here. Imagine that you are an SRE and you've been given this problem to be solved. You have a complex polyglot application uh, such as an airline booking system uh, that is deployed onto Kubernetes. As you can see, it has many microservices, a uh, couple of databases, and each of the microservices is written in a different language and uh, framework. The user is having a slow response time uh, while doing a flight booking. Now it is up to the SRE or the IT admin to try and make the user experience better. So let us look at in detail, what are the steps that an SRE can take to try to solve this problem? <clears throat> so the first aspect to be considered is observability. This is something that is very key. How closely we observe the system and all of the metrics associated will actually help us to determine where the performance bottlenecks are and how to go about tuning them. Uh, there are a number of tools out there that can help you to get better metrics. Uh, Prometheus and Grafana are, for example, a couple of the more popular ones. I would also uh, suggest that you can uh, take a look at Open Telemetry, which is um, uh, you know, slowly becoming uh, industry standard uh, when it comes to observability. One of the key things in observability is the granularity of observation. For example, if you're observing the pods on a per second basis, then you get very accurate information, but that causes a higher overhead, both in terms of CPU, uh, network activity, and in fact, disk space as well. So there's a trade-off here, and you need to be very careful in setting that value. Another aspect to consider would be to export additional operational metrics on a per application basis. Things like the spring actuator uh, or the micrometer for Quarkus, prompt client for Node.js uh, can be turned on for your application and they uh, provide additional runtime related metrics such as the heap, uh, which we can see later, uh, you know, can be used to tune the application for better performance. Uh, when you have an on-prem cloud, uh, you have the luxury of tuning the hardware all the way from the BIOS in each of your Kubernetes nodes. A uh, common setting found in BIOS relates to the choice of performance of power. 
Uh, choosing power means you get better power savings, but variable performance. The same setting bubbles up into the uh, operating system or the hypervisor as well. In the case of Linux, it's called as the scaling governor. In fact, I've seen performance drop by up to 30% with the power save option for certain workloads. Uh, if power saving is your goal, uh, then uh, you know th this is a good setting, but definitely not if performance of the application is the key goal. Um, the other thing to consider, uh, or at least be aware of, is to look at uh, hyperthreading or uh, not consider hyperthreading while doing capacity planning. Let us say a server has um, 16 cores and two threads per core. Uh, that is counted as 32 CPUs. However, hyperthreaded CPUs uh, give at most a 20% boost over a single core. And so it is best to ignore this while uh, calculating capacity. Now that our hypothetical SRE has set up observability and has fixed the hardware, what's the next step? Let's start simple. Match the application to the hardware features that is needed by the application. So node affinity is typically accomplished by setting the right labels to a node in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it is very useful if you want to assign pods to a specific hardware um, feature on the node, or maybe the node is reserved for a particular type of workload or namespace or a security constraint. In this example, we see that this particular pod, which is uh, a ML application, will only run on node that have uh, the GPU label. Uh, another way to constrain pods is to use pod affinity and pod anti-affinity. If there are pods that commonly communicate together or maybe they share some common resources, then it makes sense for them to run on the same node. We can use pod affinity rules to make sure that they all run on the same node. But what if you don't want pods from one application A to run on a node if you have pods from application be running on that node. Maybe both applications are network heavy or both use GPU extensively. Uh, whatever may be the case, we want to make sure that uh, pods from application A and application B run on different nodes. So in that case, um, we can use pod anti-affinity to make sure that they both don't run on the same node. In this example, we want a pod to be scheduled on a node only if there are other pods um, that have the same security policy S1 and don't want to schedule it on a node that is running pods that use a different security policy S2. The advantage of pod affinity and anti-affinity is that it allows the admin to dynamically assign nodes uh, for certain kind of pods without having to dedicate nodes ahead of time. Um, there are also other scheduler mechanisms such as um, taints and tolerations, uh, pod priority uh, that you can explore as well in this particular context. Now we come to the most important aspect of performance tuning in a Kubernetes cluster. Right sizing an application greatly helps to get the best possible performance. So this is done primarily by setting the CPU and memory requests and limits. So, here on the left, I have an example application deployment YAML, uh, and you can see the resources specified in the container spec section. It is very important as a best practice to always specify the resources to enable Kubernetes to make the best possible scheduling decisions. This usually means that you have to either set the guaranteed or the burstable QoS class and avoid the best effort, which means that you're, you know, in, in best effort, you're not setting anything at all. Um, to, I mean, one thing that we do need to make sure is that uh, for the best possible performance, we need to set the request to cover um, the consistent peaks um, th that we observe and the limits should be set to handle any spikes. So do ensure that the limits are high, uh, are set high enough during observation itself to prevent any throttling. Uh, also, do ensure that requests and limits that you're setting do not clash with any um, limit ranges that might apply uh, to your namespace. Now that we know that requests and limits are 
crucial to your performance, you might have a question, how do I arrive at the optimal values for requests and limits accurately? Uh, the vertical pod autoscaler can help in that regard, but I suggest you use uh, the cruise tool, which I will talk about in a minute. So let's take a closer look at the various autoscalers that Kubernetes has. So application performance depends a lot on how the app is scaled. And this is where setting the right policies for the horizontal pod autoscaler is very important. So try to use app specific metrics to set up the HPA as much as possible as using just like you know, just the um, average CPU utilization, for example, uh, might not be the best approach. Um, so for, for example, when a GC is triggered in Java, um, so this might actually cause a new uh, pod to be uh, instantiated uh, instead of uh, when actual load is increased. Uh, you can also use external metrics, uh, such as the number of concurrent users that your application is handling. But the best practice is to uh, use objects that are known to Kubernetes as much as possible, uh, such as you know the packets per second or requests per second. So in, in this particular case, uh, what we are saying is that if the packets per second, uh, the average value of the packets per second goes beyond 1K, then start a new uh, pod. Or in this particular case, uh, request per second goes beyond 10K, then we start another pod and so on. Uh, using a cluster autoscaler, uh, you know, definitely helps to make the best utilization of the underlying resources, uh, especially uh, when you're scaling down, you make sure that you free up the resources that are not being used. But you need to be very careful not to cause any service disruption in the process, uh, especially, you know, when you're downscaling. Specifying the max unavailable pods uh, in the pod disruption budget definitely helps uh, in this particular regard. So now if you're an SRE, you'll know that every runtime has many, many tunables. Uh, Java, for example, has more than 100 of them. But you'll also know that you should never touch them. Why? Because you know that, uh, you know, who knows what kind of an impact it has. Uh, and, and, you know, it has all these dependencies on other tunables. And there, there are just way too many of them for you to manually test and figure out. Uh, also, how these runtimes behave in Kubernetes environments is not always clear. Uh, so guess what? Most of the time, an SRE is just limited to tuning the app itself or tuning just the CPU and memory. Uh, by tuning, uh, you know, we all know what normally happens. Uh, we just end up doubling the resources uh, until the problem goes away. So it is difficult to be an SRE, let's be honest. Uh, you have the users bugging you for better response times, the finance wants to cut costs all the time, and you have developers uh, giving you a ton of options uh, that you find it really difficult to use. So if you're thinking there's got to be a smarter way, you're absolutely right. Um, so we are really uh, happy to announce uh, that we are having, uh, you know, we have this new tool called Cruise Autotune. Um, it's available uh, publicly. It's an open source project uh, for, we are from Red Hat. I do encourage you to uh, take a look at our uh, GitHub repo given below here. Um, so let's take a deep dive into the whole um, process that Autotune uses um, to tune uh, application. So the first step here is that the SRE encapsulates all of the performance requirements into an objective function, uh, which is an algebraic expression such as uh, you know a square divided by b plus c where maybe a can be your throughput uh, b can be response time c can be costs and um, you want to either you know maximize or minimize the whole thing in, in this particular case for example if it is a square divided by b plus c you might want to maximize it uh, and uh, here uh, each of the individual variables of the objective function are uh, specified as uh, Prometheus queries. And the whole thing is applicable to a particular uh, Kubernetes deployment, uh, which can be selected using the selector uh, out here. So at the heart of the autotune is the Bayesian optimization, which is provided by uh, the HPO service that you see here. Uh, HPO is nothing but the hyperparameter optimization service. Um, so Bayesian optimization is a type of black box optimization 
that uses probabilistic models um, uh, of the objectives uh, function uh, that, that you have specified here and that is searched efficiently to arrive at either the global maximum or the minimum as required. Uh, so essentially what's happening here is that um, uh, you know the Bayesian optimization gives you a configuration for you to try out for this particular uh, uh, you know the deployment. So it, it uh, so we have figured out what are the layers of the application, uh, what are the um, layers of the stack, and and then send all of the tunables uh, from those layers to the Bayesian optimization, which gives you a particular config value to try out. Uh, the experiment manager here deploys it. And then we get a response. Uh, I mean, we monitor uh, the uh, pod uh, with the trial configuration under load, and then uh, we get a summary of how it performed under load, and then send it back to the Bayesian uh, algorithm, which will look at the results and then um, try to find another uh, uh, config that uh, will give you better results. And so on. So this loop continues, and uh, you know, after about 100 trials, you'll find that you, uh, I mean, the Bayesian optimization has given you a config that will satisfy the objective function that you came out with, and then we come up with a config recommendation. So that's in essence how uh, we do this. So let's take a quick look at how this works. Um, so I do have a small demo out here. So I have Minikube running on my laptop here. As you can see, and it has uh, Prometheus and uh, Grafana installed in the Minikube cluster, and I also have AutoTune uh, running here, um, and I have a Tech Empower um, <coughs> uh, application, which is a Quarkus uh, REST EZ Hibernate um, application that is also running here in the cluster. And so now the challenge here is to try and optimize this particular um, uh, benchmark that is running. So what are we trying to optimize? Uh, we are trying to optimize the response time to try and minimize it. So response time is defined as request sum divided by request count, where request sum is this particular query, uh, Prometheus query, and request count is this particular Prometheus query. And this applies, of course, to the um, tech empower deployment. And we are trying to minimize response time here. So let's try to uh, apply this YAML here. And uh, you can see that um, AutoTune starts to deploy, um, uh, you know, specific configurations uh, for, and, and you know, comes up with different configurations that it can test and see how it is doing under load. Uh, of course, uh, this being a very short demo, uh, we are really, uh, you know, not, um, you know, monitoring the load, but um, just you know, giving you a sense of how the whole process works. So you can see here that it is starting multiple trials. And you can also take a look at um, list experiments here to see the configs that it is actually trying out. So here you can see it is trying with certain values of CPU and memory, and also uh, Java options that includes the hotspot layer that it has found, and uh, the Quarkus layer. So, uh, you know, very quickly, you can also look at all the layers that it has found in the application here. So it has found uh, the base container, hotspot, and Quarkus, and so on. So if you keep monitoring this, uh, it, you know, runs the whole set of uh, trials and then comes up with the best trial at the end of the experiment to say, you know, this is the one that had the best configuration. Uh, and, and you can take a look at, uh, you know, the trial uh, according to that particular trial number to figure out what was the uh, best configuration. So, um, so that's, you know, a very quick demo of uh, AutoTune. I would definitely um, recommend that you check out our GitHub repos and uh, we have this demo also running uh, I mean, available on uh, public GitHub. So it is um, available in this particular repo, uh, github.com slash cruise slash cruise demos. Uh, this is the one that I was running just now. You should be able to even run it on your own laptop as well. And this is the uh, uh, the main uh, GitHub repo. So um, now that 
you, you know, you, you've seen a very quick demo. Uh, what, what's really happening here is that, uh, you know, the, the Bayesian optimization is quickly coming to uh, try and, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, find a particular config that gives you the best result. I usually compare the Bayesian optimization to a Jenny. Uh, uh, however, there is one caveat here. The Jenny can only be asked for one wish. So you can invoke the Jenny any number of times, which means that you can invoke the Bayesian optimization for any number of experiments. But for every experiment that you're running, which consists of maybe even up to 100 trials, there can only be one objective function or only one wish. So you need to be really get creative with your wish. You know, it's, it's something like, I want to be on a beach in Hawaii with my wife and kids and walk into my large house with this great internet and so on. So basically you're trying to uh, put in all of your requirements into that one objective function and then um, uh, the Bayesian optimization will try to optimize for that particular uh, objective function. So, so you've heard all of the theory so far. So let's take a look at some of the results. Um, so here you see that, I mean, as I mentioned, um, actually we were using the Tech Empower framework, uh, which is actually an industry standard uh, framework where you have benchmarks from uh, you know, for all different kinds of runtimes, you know, Java, Golang, uh, Rust, and, and Node.js, you name it. Uh, so we specifically picked up the Quarkus REST Easy benchmark and ran this on a OpenShift uh, cluster, uh, you know, for, which had this particular configuration. Uh, and, you know, it had all of these different um, tunables that we used, uh, two, two tunables at the container layer, a bunch of tunables uh, for the hotspot layer, and uh, a few uh, for the Quarkus layer as well. And so these were the ranges within which they were operating. Um, and uh, we had set the Kubernetes request to be the same as the limits. Um, and we were uh, using the G1 GC garbage collector uh, and max RAM percentage set equal to 70. The incoming load was constant uh, at just 512 users. So we started off uh, initially, uh, you know, saying that, okay, we want to just minimize response time. But then we quickly realized that, you know, as I mentioned, uh, Bayesian optimization only tries to optimize that one aspect at the cost of maybe other uh, aspects. So we realized that the low response time came at the cost of, uh, uh, you know, higher CPU usage. Then we did another experiment where we said, okay, fix the CPU usage, um, but you know, give me lower response time. But this time we found out that it was um, giving us higher max response times or tail latencies. So this was the third take where we said, uh, okay, Jenny, uh, you know, give me the best response time, the lowest response time, uh, high throughput, uh, and at the same time, keep the max response time or the tail latencies down and keep the resources fixed. So uh, essentially, we gave it weightages as well. We said response time has the highest weightage, throughput comes next, max response time uh, is uh, the you know, least in terms of the weightages and keep make sure that you fix the CPU and memory uh, so that the cost is the same. So, so it, you know, the zeroth um, value here it corresponds to the default one where there were no changes done to the application configuration uh, with the same resources as uh, the rest of the experiment. And so here we see that it is, you know, the default was about 14.21 milliseconds of response time. And then we see the, the, uh, the auto-tune um, coming up with different configurations and trying them out. And then uh, we got the best configuration uh, around the 97th trial where it uh, got a response time of 2.39 milliseconds. So you can see here um, that we, I mean, this has actually achieved about 83% better response time with a small, uh, or, or the throughput being almost the same. And um, uh, of course, the tail latencies uh, were low as well. So you can take a look at all of these results uh, here. These are available on github.com uh, cruise slash autotune results repo. Uh, these are uh, available publicly as well. So you can see that um, the max response time in the autotune case is down. The CPU usage is almost the same as the default. 
um, and uh, we got a really good uh, response times, uh, about 83% better response time as well. Um, and we also calculated the cost um, of the hardware by uh, looking at the data that we got from the previous experiment for both the uh, default and the auto-tune config. We measured how many instances it would take to handle 1 million transactions and applied it on a matching AWS configuration, uh, AW, A1.extra-large, which is about uh, four core, eight gig. Uh, and we observed with the auto-tune config, there's a 8% reduction in cost as well. So this is the corresponding best configuration. Uh, the right side column in the, is, is the value for each of the tunables uh, that we saw previously. Uh, interestingly, uh, you see that auto-tune has flipped some of the defaults uh, from what the runtime itself sets. Okay, so um, in summary, if you are an SRE, you know, your first uh, step is to set up observability. Uh, don't forget to tune the hardware, set the node and pod affinities, ensure requests and limits are set for all app pods and uh, they're right sized, um, uh, use app specific scaling metrics if possible, uh, ensure that there is no disruption with the uh, pod disruption budget and uh, please do check out the uh, cruise auto tune for autonomous uh, tuning and and uh, we, we do plan to come back to you with some updates so um, lastly do check out the cruise github repos you have any questions reach out, reach out to us on uh, cruise slack or send us a mail uh, we do look forward to hearing from you all uh, thank you so much for listening Hey, Dinakar, thanks a lot for the uh, session and it was really informative and very helpful. And I hope uh, the participants are benefited by this very informative session. And if you have any questions, you can pose the questions on the chat and uh, Dinakar is available to answer. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for the... Uh, session and it was really informative and very helpful and I hope uh, the participants are benefited by this very informative session and if you have any questions you can pose the questions on the chat and uh, Dinakar is available to answer. Thank you Ashok. Um, happy to answer any questions that folks have here. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, looks like there are not much questions, no questions on the chat that I see, but I have one question then occur, say, if, um, if, uh, like, say, if there is a fresh grad who would like to get into this uh, open source space, like, what is your recommendation that you would like to give? Or maybe someone who would like to switch their career path, maybe after 10 years of experience, and if you think that, okay, they'd like to switch their career path, what is your recommendation that you would like to give then occur? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that that's a general question. So I would say that, uh, you know, my, the first step that I would always suggest is for people to uh, understand what are their own preferences. You know, there's like a wide variety of open source software that's available uh, today. I mean, there's system software, front end, back end, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, machine learning, cloud and so on. So, so there's multiple different uh, uh, you know, open source projects uh, that are available. And I think that the best way is to first understand what are your own interests and then find out projects in that particular space. So for example, uh, you know, I'm a guy who's uh, been interested in systems technology all my life. I've worked in operating systems, JVM and Kubernetes now and so on. 
So I always tend to look around in this space and see what are the new things coming up. And of course, now these days I'm interested in machine learning. Who is not, right? Everybody, that's the buzzword now. So um, and if you look around, I, I'm sure you'll find an open source project that you are interested in. So that's the first step. Next step is to find out what is the community around it. Find out what, you know who are the different um, uh, like stakeholders. Do they have a Slack channel? Do they have Gitter? Uh, is there a mailing list? So go join there, find out uh, what's the best way to interact. L you know, look at GitHub, obviously GitLab or anything that's around. Uh, look at issues. Most of the projects these days have something like a good first issue that has been marked on GitHub issues. So you look at that and see, you know, what are the issues? It could be simple things like fixing, um, uh, you know, language or uh, or maybe some simple issues and so on. So you can look at that and see if you can start getting into the project by understanding the process. How do you submit a PR? Uh, you know, b basics of GitHub and things like that. And then you can, uh, you know, read m more on the topic, look at videos and uh, talk to experts, talk to the community folks see if there's a meetup or attend some things like this KCD Chennai, understand more about the topic, and then, uh, uh, you know, gradually you take it up there. So that, that's the way I would look at it. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Anikar. Uh, that answers my question. And I like the red hat on your backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, folks, please make use of this time uh, for Q&A and if you don't have any questions then we'll have Dinakar go uh, so that he can enjoy his rest of the weekend. It's already Friday. Attend the rest <laughs> of the talks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks Dinakar. Yeah. 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 Thank you all and thanks. it's been a pleasure uh, being in this. Uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, organizing this um, great event. Sure. Thanks. Thanks Dinakar. Thank you. Bye. Uh, we'll have the next uh, session starting in a few minutes, so uh, please hang in there. Thanks.